In the history of South Sydney, there have been teams and players that defied the odds, captured hearts and created legacies. Conducting the presentation, he passes over to Sattler, the JJ Gilton and Shield, as South Sydney adds to its rugby league glory. But for 43 long years, there was little to celebrate. Weight of nearly half a century of unfulfilled dreams, of near misses and the heart-wrenching defeats, hung over us like a dark cloud. But droughts are broken by belief, by a relentless will to change the narrative, to defy the odds, and to finally claim what was once thought impossible. And every time I look at this ring, I see years of dedication, sacrifice and glory. A legacy that will live on forever. Ladies and gentlemen, South Sydney 2014 NRL Premiers! This is a story about a group of ordinary people that did extraordinary things. Johnson, the proud Rabbitoh himself, the local junior who has waited so long for this moment. It's a fantastic story for many people. Let's do this! Sherry and White blossoms again and the Wembley way. 2011 Carnegie Challenge Cup winners, the Wigan Warriors. Yeah, I was um, coaching in Wigan at the time and out of the blue a phone call came from the powers to be of South and the opportunity to come back was alive. I was really enjoying my time there at Wigan. You know, the team had really changed over there and they were in a great place and they were playing some really good footy and I just felt that it was the right time and it was Richo, you know, jumped on a plane and... After we won the Premiership of Penrith in 2003, middle of 2004, Nick Pappas contacted me through a friend of mine and asked whether I'd be interested in coming to South and uh, so I sat down with Nick and decided the challenge of taking over the greatest club in the game and taking it from the bottom to the top was something I couldn't refuse. He failed to tell me we were a million dollars worse off in finance than we were, but uh, at the end of the day, it was a tough gig for the first uh, couple of years. Impressive first half from the Warriors, but the South Sydney fans are not happy with the effort of their side. No! Oh, I love Wow! This season oh, might be over. over! He won't be playing a part. We said to John, look, mate, you're only going to be there for two years. You were in the Premiership or otherwise, you're going to be there for two years. And you can stay as football manager if you want to. But that'll give me time to search for the right coach without going behind your back. He said, yep, okay, Rich, I'm up for that. And that allowed me to go out and search for the best coach possible. And I wasn't probably thinking at the time that it was real until he sort of sat in the lounge room and we talked about where the club was at and I wanted to know a lot more about you know the, the workings and where the club was going. And I always looked at the list and I thought that it was a pretty special list that you know I could do something with. And you know, I then had a phone call from Nick Pappas. He was down in London, so I jumped on the train and went down and met up with Nick and Russ ended up coming into town. Everybody understands the story of the underdog. And that's what this story is. There was a, I don't know whether you call it a hotel or motel, on the outskirts of Wigan. He was situated down in the garden, yeah, waiting for me. So I uh, we went down and had a really good conversation. People admire anybody from any walk of life who picks them up by themselves, up by the bootstraps and, and changes their life, changes how people perceive it, you know, changes their own destiny through sheer hard work. And that's what people see in this. Just gave me the, the insight into what the club meant to so many people. It just sort of matched up and it was probably the reasons that really made me want to come back and believe that we could do something. My first day uh, on the job at uh, South, uh, really looking forward to everything that's in front of us. Uh, met all the players uh, and they look really, really keen. So we're looking forward to a, a really good season ahead. You know, obviously got a lot of work to do uh, in front of us, but uh, looking forward to a tough pre-season and then taking that into the season. When I landed, I met at Mark Ellison for the first time and. I knew sort of Mark's history you know, with his playing days and he knew the makings of everything that went on around the club and I actually said to him, I said, mate, I just want to meet everyone. I want to be able to work out what the real fabric of South was all about. So, you know, I came here to the juniors and uh, met Keith McGraw and he sort of gave me a bit more of an idea of, you know, the, the history and I got an understanding of obviously, you know, the club had been through so much, but I was coming from a point of, you know, a new start. I said, mate, I'd love to meet George Biggins and... I promise you, till you people walk away, I won't. The South Sydney Football Club as it stands now doesn't represent what I represent, so I'll move on. I'll never forget when I walked out of George's house, he shook my hand 
and he wished me all the best. He goes, mate, you can do something pretty special here. So I got a feel for what everyone was feeling about the club and I got reminded that it was 41 years. You know, everyone was living in a little bit of hope. You know, obviously I understand all the pressures that are involved in a big club like South and I'm really fortunate and, and lucky to be coaching a club like this. I was fortunate to bring some people in. I started my career down at the Melbourne Storm. I really thought his coaching philosophy was something that was always going to take him to a head coaching role as well. It was a pretty easy decision when he said come and run the performance department at the Rabbitohs. And then I was able to have Kurt Wrigley and Wayne Collins as my main assistants when I first started. I'd played with Madge at the Adelaide Rams. He wasn't really as driven a player as he was as a coach. A lot more discipline, a lot more belief in himself. He was a guy on a mission, and I thought he was exactly what we needed. You know, Madge and I worked together in Canberra. We were good mates, and then you know, I was at Penrith at the time with Matthew Elliott, and he said, are you coming? So I was excited about coming back and working with him because I'd know that he went to Melbourne. They were defensively the best team in the comp, you know, and I was going to learn a lot. If you want to work hard and you want to win, Madge is your man. Eddie Farrer, he was the physio here and he'd go down as probably one of the all-time greatest physios that I've worked with. Prior to the regime under Mike McGuire, you know, I was the only physio really. He was pretty adamant that we needed to grow each and every department. So our football department you know, doubled within a couple of years. So he was campaigning to the board to try and increase our funding. Sitting here with uh, Eddie and uh, Tom uh, on the state-of-the-art equipment uh, inside a physio room in a medical department. I guess that was the nature of the staff, that they were willing to do whatever it took. It was just one big family just on, a, on the surge to try and create something great. You know, we just want to work hard and improve on what, what's here at the moment. And, you know, we had, a, as I said, a good start this morning and we're looking forward to uh, furthering that in the pre-season. Now Harrison, runners inside, goes outside, Sutton on debut, gets himself a try. When I arrived at the club, we were absolute rubbish. Our roster was terrible. Quite often, Jeremy Monaghan's the media manager. I go through the, the team at the time, and like you wouldn't even recognise the names, and some of them should never have played first grade. Well, we had three really good young juniors, and they're all going to be poached. And George were heavily on Sato. He'd come through, won 11 premiership states leading up to 18, and I had to keep him. Talk to his parents, his mum and dad, and you know, and Sato and everything else. And I finally they agreed for him to stay. And when he stayed, all of these young juniors were coming through. They all stayed too and they formed the nucleus of the side that took us to the next level. So it was a, a red letter day the day we signed uh, Johnny Sutton. Growing up, you know, surfing and, you know, just having a good time, you know, to finally, you know, achieve something like that for myself was a really proud moment and couldn't do it anywhere else because I love this club and, you know, to come through the grades and get a contract like that was huge for me and my family. Well, when I first got to the club, we had Peter Cusack, David Kidwell, Peachy, Dave Falongo, and we had a number of senior players. So Sato was, was one of the young ones, we were one of the young ones coming through, but Sato obviously had the history of being at South and wanting to play for the Bunnies and only play for the Bunnies. And in terms of footy head, he, he's one of the smartest operators with the football. He's big and powerful as well. So he brought a lot to the football team in terms of ability. Sato was probably one of the favourite players to play alongside. I mean, Sato had that connection on the field with each other. He's the heart of South Sydney. I remember when first grade used to train at Erskineville Oval, the NRL boys had all their names on the lockers. Sut was that one you sort of looked up to. So I remember getting some strapping tape, putting it up on his locker and writing my name under it. I thought it'd be ripped off straight away, but he left it for a while. Sut was always one of them guys who you knew just wouldn't let you down. He was one of them teammates you could always go to and be open for, for advice. When he spoke, everyone stopped and listened and in team reviews and stuff like that, his voice got louder and louder because he probably realised himself that, you know, he's got a good footy head and, and understands the game very, very well. He's one of the, um, up there was one of the greatest players I've coached. He just trained every session. But I saw Sato crawling out to the field and he would be dragging out all these young kids and teach him how to train. I don't think he ever missed a session. And just uh, looking at me. The word got out. First thing uh, everyone heard of was a big shot he put on Fui Fui Moi Moi. Oh, Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess. An 18, 19 year old kid at the time putting a big shot on a well-known NRL player. In 2009, he would have got here on his birthday in December. I've never had this sort of coverage in England, and uh, 
like it's you know it's just a good feeling I, I don't know how to explain it man I feel a little bit emotional it, you know in a way just um, just overwhelmed by support they getting you know really. yeah my first impression he was a big fella <laughs> couldn't really understand him that much he always trained hard he was always good around the boys so he was massive for our squad he was so good when he first got here it probably took him four weeks to settle in but from that point he was just such a dominant force from Burgess. Burgess has hit him with everything, including his birth certificate. He's tough as fucking nuts, man. Toughest person I've ever come across. You know, he's very inspirational. Played 80 minutes most games. He's an agile, big guy with ball skills. Tough to bring around, he's got a big motor. He definitely does things at times that you're like, wow, that's impressive. It's completely Burgess, taken by Sonny Bill William. Everyone knew at times that they had to do it, they had to be a leader. Sam so definitely set a good platform for that. Everyone's pretty pumped to, you know, if we do what we know we can do this year, we'll, we'll do all right. I think after he'd sort of gone through that year or two, he then wanted to just be like, I'm the man, I'm the most dominant. I think he realistically started thinking two premierships and that's how I'm going to become a great. I'm enjoying, enjoying training with these guys. Hopefully we can sit together for a few years and, you know, try and pull in some trophies. Cheers, mate. Cheers, cheers, cheers. 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 Well, South was a funny one because I just came back from a, uh, the 2010 Melbourne Storm Saga. The penalty will be the stripping of three minor premierships and two premierships. In the 2010 season, all competition points earned thus far will be taken away and the team shall not accrue any further points in the 2010 season. Here's Inglis for the corner. He started it, he finishes it, and that is the exclamation point. It was difficult. Leaving Melbourne was difficult for me. I went and had a chat with Essendon Football Club in AFL down there. I didn't want to leave Melbourne itself, but I agreed to terms with Brisbane. It's been a great day for the Broncos today. I'm announcing now that uh, Greg Inglis has agreed to terms to uh, play with the Broncos in 2011 and 2012. I moved up there, was settled all in. You know, first week I was supposed to start training, I, I get a phone call from Anthony Mundine and he goes, oh, Russell's got to give you a call. I was thinking, yeah, right, this is a load of crap. He's not going to call, so, you know, whatever. He's probably out doing some movies and crap like that. But he ends up giving me a call and um, to me, uh, you know, just a country kid that never thought I would ever get to play rugby league, especially in the NRL. And, you know, all of a sudden on the phone to Russell Crowe. <laughs> so I hung up on him. <laughs> I hung up with me twice and then <laughs> before he ran back the third time and Top sends me a message that this is really him, you need to answer. He spoke about the history behind it, he spoke about the community. A great friend of mine, uh, Lou Zivanovic, rang me up and said, Richard, would you like GI? And I said, well, stop mucking around. And he said, no, no, he doesn't want to go to Brisbane and uh, I think he'd like to go to Redfern. And I'm, so I said, well, I'd love to talk to him. And really at the time, News Limited owned both Brisbane and Melbourne. Yeah, you know, Greg thought it was them sort of forcing him to go to Brisbane and he didn't want it. I spoke to his manager, Alan Ganey, and Greg came and saw me with Nick and, and everything else. And we spoke and did, talked about the money and et cetera. And then, uh, you know, most of my family are South Sydney driving our supporters. So I rang my parents up and told me to meet me in Sydney and I just told them that I'm going to join South. We did the deal pretty quickly and, he, and then I had to get it through the salary cap order, which took a lot longer. The NRL rejected the original contract and remained disappointed that South lodged it, knowing they did not have room under their salary cap to accommodate Inglis's true value. When we signed Greg Inglis, we had to move a player. They were able to poke his nose through the line and plant the ball down for their opening four-pointer. But here comes Bo Champion and the Rabbitohs hit back! Yeah, well, I was a local junior, come through the junior bunny systems, and then I debuted at the NRL at 18 years old. Russell was coming through the sheds at the time. He just said, can you give your cousin a call? And I didn't know who he was talking about at the time. And I, I sort of said, oh, who? And he said, Greg. And We grew up playing touch. We used to come down to Sydney, stay at his house, and he sort of showed me the ropes around South Sydney. And 
in Tread Champ Styles. All of a sudden Greg was at training, wearing a South jersey and getting his photo taken for the Telegraph. I just remember having a conversation with Nathan Merritt at the time saying, well, we can win a comp now. Like, this is actually starting to become real. I remember being at a wedding one day and the news came out that Greggy signed with Rabbitohs and, you know, it was, just, it was a major, you know, um, uplifting for the whole club and the spirit of South Sydney and getting one of the, the best players to ever play in the NRL to come to your club. And, and I started to then think to myself, hold on a second, they've got to also be able to fit Greg into a cap here. He's a marquee player. I knew that our cap was pretty tight as it was. He's a centre, I'm a centre. I wasn't uh, under any illusion as to what could happen. Craig Bellamy actually reached out to me. He said that the opportunity to play at Melbourne and alongside them players would improve my game and also would be a new experience as well. You know, I'd be mad if, if I didn't take that opportunity at the time. I never thought I'd be a good enough player to play for Melbourne because when you're coming through, they're making grand finals every single year. You know, only the best of the best play at Melbourne. Obviously, Melbourne needed to make it happen as well for them to progress forward. And that's the only reason that they could come around was Bo to go with Melbourne and we do a player swap. And Bo champion, he's sprinting away! We won a minor premiership the year later in Melbourne and at the time I just wanted to give them as much chance to win a competition as possible and that was getting Greg Inglis. If Bowen hadn't made the decision to do that, we wouldn't have been able to fit Greg into the cap. But we finally got it through on the Christmas Eve and as I said many times, I turned to my CFO at the time and said, we've just won the 21st Premiership. And out there in the bottom, Greg Inglis! Greg Inglis has scored! A moment from Maryville! But when I was appointed to get the role, you know, Greg was the first person to ring me. You know, he spoke about what he wanted to try and achieve and I knew then that you know, Greggy's focus was the guy that I remember when I was down from Melbourne um, and you know, he sort of even spoke of that maturity that I think he understood of what was expected of him as he was going through that stages uh, and then you know, when I arrived um, he just has jump, jumped on board everything that we're trying to achieve. I think it was after the 2012 pre-season and he said he was going to name five captains called me in his office and said, you've got to be one of them. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't really want to be captain. We sat down and had the, had the conversation about where do we want to go with this. And, you know, I had some really big names in and amongst the team, but I had some younger ones coming through. And Saturday just held the glue of the team on the vision of what we wanted. And mate, he is obviously through and through south. So that made that really easy. He just carried himself in a way that everyone wanted to play for him. You know, my attitude definitely changed from there on. You know, I was always wanting just to do my part Obviously now Major wanted me to step up, so it was actually the best ever, you know, being able to captain the club and it's definitely something special that I'll always hold close to my heart. I think he was probably a little bit reluctant to start with. He's a pretty quiet sort of character and, you know, he probably looked around and saw a few of the other personalities, but the rest of the players that were leaders within the group, they played their part, you know, so they allowed Sato to be Sato. Sato was the most respected one out of us all. Sato wouldn't say stuff he wouldn't do. I think what worked so well was, you know, you had the three main leaders in Sato, and Sammy and, and I. Sammy was, you know, he was a vocal one, he was a talkative one. He was really good at bringing the crew together and bringing the boys together and getting them up for games. And so we all brought different traits to the table and I think that was a key to it. Yeah, we had disagreements on some things and how we can play this out or, you know, handing down things or how can we do things different. But at the end of the day, we, you know, we backed one another. Us three back one another no matter what. We go back to November 2011. It was probably a turning point for the team there when we started pre-season and I think that really set the tone for us. Yeah, training's been fun. It's, uh, it's tough. That's how pre-season should be. He's a likeable guy and uh, the boys get along with him. For me personally, this has been the toughest pre-season I've ever taken part in. Very strict coach, which is good. That's what we need. Very disciplined. I remember Chrissy McQueen and Dave Churrell, we sent him on a long run and it was really just a test to see where this group was at and they were a fair way behind the pack and I'm thinking, what have I got here? So I think the first one was an eye opener for everyone. I mean, Dave Churrell got back from Vegas on the Sunday and started training on the Monday. I didn't probably look after myself, we were you know, still young but that's not really an excuse. You know, things certainly weren't easy before that but compared to what Michael McGuire brought to the club. It was chalk and cheese, so everyone's professionalism just went through the roof. That was tough, bro. Holy. And we had that Sydney Park run, there's a couple of Sydney Park runs. There was a Maroopa run, and there was a um, Moor Park 
we had players that started walking up hills and from our experience, you know, those sort of guys were the ones that were going to let you down in the 79th minute of a grand final. Every year I was in a fat club. Yeah, Tomo just, I'm sure he just put me in there. It was me and GI for years. Bully can't throw stones because Bully was the first one in there every time. He came back two weeks early before I did anyway. And I was always the first one out before him, so Bully has <laughs> got a lot to answer for with that. 4.30 alarm goes off, 5 o'clock leaving the house for 6 o'clock start in Fat Club, so I'll just walk straight past all the skin folds, all the weight scales, <laughs> and walk straight into the cardio room. One of our first meetings held up a blank piece of paper and said this is the team. We all had to prove ourselves. The playing group, they bought in you know, to the change of where we're going. You could feel the hunger that was there. The staff just got behind everything that we were doing. And The very first wrestle session we had, the intensity of it was just unbelievable. So it shocked quite a few players here as to the level that we had to get to. You know, I was waiting for all these secret moves, but there's no secret moves. It was tackling. Adam Reynolds tackling Sammy Burgess. Adam Reynolds tackling Georgie Burgess. You pick him up and put him with someone and go again. And that's how we got better. And we got better quickly. Sutton goes short to the second man. Dummy from England. The big blood heading for the corner. Team ball over the top of them. the fans as well as it does us. And, uh, like I said, it's a great atmosphere tonight and a great stage to play on and, uh, you know, we're grateful for the win. These two foundation clubs, 104. I'd been part of a very successful club in St. Helens, came through with my friends, but it was crunch time, it was time for me to come and, and test myself over here in the NRL. The opportunity with the Bulldogs and a couple of other clubs came up and yeah, landed over here in early December 2011. Now Sam and I were roommates for England and teammates for England, so he's my friend. But it's weird what we do to our friends when we play against each other. At the dead ball line, it came off Burgess, went to Sutton, and now they're going to mix it up a little bit. So that was the, the start of it all. Burgess and Graham. A wonderful crowd, the biggest crowd before tonight for a battle between South and Canterbury. We go back to the 67 grand final, 56,300 on. That will be blown away tonight, surely, as we fit the final piece to our grand final puzzle. The winner tonight will take on Melbourne at this ground next Sunday in the 2012 decider. Tremendous atmosphere. I still remember sitting down, looking out to that game, and you know, I think there were probably a few more Canterbury supporters at the time in that stadium. Maybe that's just how I felt. South Sydney running from right to left, kicks off the second preliminary final. One of them will play Melbourne here tomorrow week. In the opening seconds of the game, Keating puts in a kick, he's knocked over, the ball is bumped back. Real opportunity and Cassiano to Josh Reynolds, it's gone to win, who will score? And it has been an onslaught. With a chance to return, serve and Burgess goes hard at the Chief Destroyer. Outside, inside ball. And he Grand final category. He's over Isaac Luke. Little Isaac has gone over to score for the Bunnies. It's very much switched on here tonight as Adam Reynolds puts a kick in that'll find the line. He was a little general getting us from the other field. You know, he's got one of the best kicking games and he was, you know, displaying that. He's gone from Pettingbourne slop all the way to Reynolds and Adam puts a kick in. It might sit down, it's going to sit down. Now they've got some defence to do. Jonathan Wright can't repel that. No, hamstring. No one near him. Yeah, 
that was a big turning point in the game. We lost a bit of our way, you know, finishing sets and, you know, the Bulldogs were, you know, one of the best teams all year and they were playing really good footy. Wide for Perrin to score. He puts a kick and there could be a try. There could be a try here for Jonathan Wright. He lobs the ball away, they're in again. Sam From a Bulldogs point of view, we were, you know, delighted to beat South. It was a real rivalry starting to build there. We were bringing crowds there. We really were. Like there was a great sense of atmosphere every time we played each other. You know, we made it pretty far, but we probably weren't thinking the grand final. Or, well, I was just trying to take one game at a time, and I just felt like we got a lot of confidence out of that year. We've gone from obviously a team that's been flirting around the finals to being one game away from being a part of a grand final. And I still remember the feeling of everyone was just in so much joy around the fact that we're in that position. What about playing here in front of over 70,000 people? What do you got to say to your fans? Oh, thank you very much for coming out and supporting us and you've been all terrific all year. And uh, you know, they'll always be there and you know, they're very much diehard fans. Which I sort of felt, you know, well, we didn't do the job. We had, didn't get it done. so. You know, I was having that feeling, but it was nice to see people enjoying the difference of where we were to, to where the boys and the staff got us to. But South Sydney, I really thought, took it to them, and they were in front when Adam Reynolds gets hurt. So you don't know what happens after that time if that man can stay on the field. In the end, though, it looked as though the Bulldogs had far more creativity than South Sydney, and I think would have got them anyway. I felt that we needed something to come into the team to inject another level of where we were going, and he was it. the Broncos at the time. I needed to get to a team where I could play more minutes and where I could start. My manager at the time told me there was an opportunity to go to South Sydney. To be honest, it wasn't one that I was jumping at. Wasn't sure about the club and whether that was going to be the best place for me. We're talking mid-2012 and I remember they went all the way to the finals. I thought, wow, there's a bit there, there's a lot of talent. Mate, I like Benny's style. He played the game the way I wanted it to be played. He told me if I come to the club that I'd start every week and I'd be an 80 minute player and that he thought he could get the best out of me, so it worked out. See, there's a rule in the gym that you can't dance in the gym unless you've played 50 games. Now, D Walks, how many games have you played? I've only played 11, mate. So you shouldn't really be dancing in the gym? I don't dance in the gym, I dance in the change rooms. Yeah. Wow. Dylan Walker, great character. Young kid comes in and the world's at his feet. Uh, last week, the boy started a rumour. He got a pedicure on his toes. As you can see, his toes are all over the place. It's, it's just like that, cuz. I paid $30 to get the pedicure. You gotta look after your feet. You don't, you don't want the fungal on your feet, man. First NRL contract, my sister and my mum were in the room and sort of negotiated it. You know, I was just a young, bright eyed kid. Grew up in Bonnie and Mascot, and that's all I ever wanted to do was play for South Sydney. I had trained a few times with the Gold Coast Titans under 20s and I still remember we got sat down at the end of that year a group of us and said that was, we're not really wanted there. They were coming last at the time, so that's how good I was going. And my manager actually had Ryan Carr, who just got signed to South that year in the top 30 as a halfback from Redcliffe. And I said, mate, is there anything I want to come back to Sydney? Mum and dad were in Sydney. I ended up in the 20s squad just for the pre-season. I think I ended up full-time, probably the back end of 2012. Luke's turned up and he basically started reciting everything that went on in Wigan. So I sort of went, geez, that's, that's different. I haven't heard this one. I've got a footballer here, he's got a football mind. There's gonna be something in Luke Kiry moving forward. I mean, it was just the perfect club, the perfect coaches for what I needed at that particular time in my career. Just taught me how to become a first grader. So Sammy had been here for a year. He'd organised for me to meet a couple of people from the club. And yeah, Russell had a crazy idea that you know, if we could put a brotherhood within a team, we could instill that true brotherhood feeling within a team. And I said yes straight away. Didn't even see the contract. Kind of inevitable for that I was going to try to come out here at some point. And it wasn't going too great over in England at Bradford, you know, financial problems. And they actually couldn't offer me a contract. So I was, I was definitely looking at coming to Australia. But then uh, Wigan came in and offered me a good contract, three years at the time. So I was, you know, just, they offered me a one-year deal, minimum wage. Got on the phone to the brothers and uh, Big Georgie was saying, just get on the flight, you're going to love it. Where are you going, lad? No, we're just going back to mine for a clean, lad. 
tonight. Yeah, big feed tonight. George, why are you always the last out of the showers? Always, always last. I feel the best. Luke and Sam um, always saw them as the older brothers. But I think the, yeah, the biggest change I saw was in my twin brother and his size and his athleticism and looks like it's changed, you know, he looked in great nick. He's inside the 10, he's in for his second, the booster. So I was at the Gold Coast Titans at the time. Souths had some injuries in the outside backs to Matt King and also Dylan Farrell. And then I'd spoken to Madge about the opportunity to come back and I really wanted to come back as well. I could tell straight away it was a different club to when I'd left. And because I'd been through the Melbourne system, I knew Madge had been through the Melbourne system, it wasn't a shock to me, the intensity of training or the long days or you know, the army camps and things like that. It was again, just more so around seeing these other players in that same environment that I'd experienced in Melbourne and then understanding that it was gonna give them the best opportunity to again, be able to win. People like Michael Crocker and Benny Lowe, and they set the level of training at such a high level. I mean, I use Croc as an example. Like, he couldn't walk half the time because he was that busted. But as soon as he got across the white line, he trained at a level that everyone there had to go to his level because they saw how he walked down on the field. So little things like that made what the, the identity of the group was about. And then, yeah, people like Benny T yeah, come along and he came in and ripped into the training and at times, yeah, gave me some challenges. When I went there and trained under Madge, there was a new level. You know, pre-season was just something like I've never experienced before. Getting there in the morning, 7 a.m., doing prehab, doing stretching, having meetings, lifting weights, doing video, going on the field, training, coming off, and then someone says that we're going to wrestle in the afternoon, and I just couldn't believe it. Uh, I was sitting in the shed saying, like, what are we doing? This is crazy. Mick Crocker said to me, Tio, shut the fuck up. This is what we do here. I think they encouraged each other to go to different levels. Everyone's got a different barometer of what that might be. It was just the makings of the group wanting to work hard and outdo each other. We used to do the Kudji to Clovelly run, and we did that twice, and then we ran around to the Kudji steps, and we like, you just kind of keep doing them until someone passes out. Roy was the one who passed out, and we had to call an ambulance for, so. Yeah, we went on those camps, which you might have heard about. I think it was three days Three days of torture. Not every club was doing them. We didn't really know what to expect. Then we done the cap, the whole through the cap at the end of the year, and that was the toughest thing I've ever done. It was pretty outrageous. I don't think I've ever done anything like it. We did push it a little bit too hard on those army camps. That was the worst one I've ever been on. I almost fainted on the, on the sand dunes out there. I think they even pizza to carry me up. 13 one, my first one, was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. We actually did one this season with the Roosters with the two commando guys who we did with South. They still talk about that camp. Like, they go, mate, Madge is the most craziest guy with, like, the stuff he wanted them to do. He wanted to see who wanted to quit. <laughs> They'd been going for a couple of days and we were late at night, I think it was about one o'clock and we pulled them out of bed and they had to go up to a pool session which they all probably talk about. We are asleep in the bush and these guys showed up to ambush us, get us in these cars and take us to the pool session. And I've got to pull a bomb, swim to the side, that's it. That's as much as you get out of me. Sade, he can't swim. Benny Lowe can swim. I couldn't swim back then. That's one of the worst exercises I've ever had to do. It was like a four hour pool session. We were treading water in the pool, but they made us tread water in full kit with our shoes on as well. So it was like ridiculous. And Benny kept grabbing the side of the pool and the army dude's like, get your hand off the side. And he just hops out of the pool, snaps and goes, we're footy players, not army players. I was like, bro, get in the pool before they, <laughs> they smash us even more. So we had these steel bars, so they're, they're heavy, they're 20, 30 kilos, I don't know, but they're heavy. And in teams, we had to move these bars from one end of the pool to the other end. The deep end of the pool's three metres, four metres deep, whatever it is. In a group, you know, you're trying to sort of sink to the bottom and you're trying to pass it to someone else and then you go back up and Mero got stuck holding one and he's on the bottom of the water holding this thing. And we had to swim with him, 50 metres, get out, commander asked him, oh, give us a number. And Sammy goes and says, 80. 
big hit. All right, <laughs> you got 80 chin ups, 80 push ups, 80 burpees, 80 crunches, and then 80 tea bags. And tea bags are in and out. And then right at the end, we buddied up with a partner. I've got Chris McQueen, and I think he's just had it. So if I'm in the water, my partner's out of the water holding my legs, and you'd lift yourself up. And when they say go down, you'd have to lower yourself down and upside down into the water and stay there for as long as you could. First one, you know, they go up five seconds. You go for five, then 10, then 15. And then it just kept going up until eventually it was right. I just always go for as long as you can. I'm not a swimmer, I've never been good in the water. It would go down in five seconds. I think I made that in 10 seconds. I probably barely made that. As soon as you go down, it starts clicking. <laughs> Bring it back up. You're up, right, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I've never seen someone so scared of water. That was one of the things. It's an army camp and it's Mark McGuire and everyone's just. You know, we're all professionals and we're all perfectionists and we don't want to let the team down, we don't want to let anybody down. The hardest thing I've ever done, we're in a room for maybe maybe eight to 12 hours. Brown rice and white rice, two wheelbarrows come in, spill it all on the ground, and they ask us to separate them all. No one's allowed to talk, say a word, make a noise. So everyone would just go and grab a handful and go to their own little corner and just start separating rice. And then after about 10 or 15 minutes, a guy come in and goes, all right, I'm gonna put on this song, this song is the favorite song of, you know, one of our fallen brothers in Danger Zone, come on. Do, 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 do. And it finished and the boys like, oh, that's pretty cool, bit of music, that's cool. And then it started again. And everyone sort of had a bit of a laugh and he stopped and he said, boys, this is an important song. This song means something to all of us. Don't laugh. You're not allowed to talk anyway, but don't laugh. Okay, so everyone's quiet, song played again and again, and again, and again for six hours. And I hate this, nightmares. And they were just pulling guys one by one into a room. So they called me out, took me to a room, and they shut me in a door, and I remember he just said, think of the most physically, mentally, and emotionally draining thing you can think of, and prepare for it. So I'm backed up in the corner, ready. One by one, they just took us to the other room, and they flogged us, and then they brought us back in to continue counting rice and Between 40 minutes and an hour, I think Ben Lowe went for like an hour and a half. And I took him out, flogged him, and he came back. And all of us was looking at <laughs> I was used as a demonstration for the rest of the army boys who were gonna put the rest of the boys through these lanes. I had a trainer, Jimmy. We'd had a little bit of a battle early that day. He just picked me out of the group and was going for me. He was super impressed, I think, at that. And we created a really good bond to this point. Now we're still in contact to this day. And that was definitely something that I'll never forget, especially that song that rings through my head from time to time, for sure. As soon as I hear that, I'm just, I'm straight back in that hall. I'm thinking about that army camp. I don't think that'll ever change. I think I was 20 at the time, 2021, 20, doing one of those and I was like, like, is this how first grade is every year? What they done was put us so under pressure so much. When it become tough, we just think, oh, what did we just go through? I'm so grateful I got to do that, especially at that time of my career. So young, you learn, you can get through different things. It just instilled hardness and toughness. I think that was probably the reason why you can see the shift in the and change in the club and in the players, because they knew what hard work and dedication was. By the end of it, they actually were singing and the commandos were getting the shits because they couldn't annoy these players. So I remember standing there with a, a good friend of mine who was the, the chief of the commandos at the time, Brett Chandler, and he goes, mate, you've got a pretty special group here because this doesn't happen very often. Enjoy it, rugby league is back. The season was unreal.
like we were the best team in the competition that year and we knew we'd be the team to beat in the finals. And we won the first semi against Melbourne. Isaac Lucas for the he makes it! Carried that momentum through to that preliminary final. And... Adam Reynolds has got a big job, so has John Sutton. They've all got a big job because they're up against a class backline. The best halves in the competition against this young fellow tonight. Thor and Cherry Evans up against Adam Reynolds and John Sutton. The men inside, they, yeah, they were pretty dominant in that new era. We went up, we had all the energy. We led in the first half 14 0. Snap all that out. Here's John Sutton, he's over the line. First try of the match. Big John Sutton has scored. Sutton, they go beautifully along the back line. Goodwin goes to the 10. They're in the score. Nathan Merritt, he levels up with Eddie Webb. And Benny Waring kicks the 100. He's got a season and he's got it. John Stewart, he was playing a pretty average game. It's a high tackle and it's on the board. He basically put them on his back and... Goes to Jerry. I think they sort of went into the half-time feeling it probably a little bit more up because they had not had a really good half of football and then they gained confidence. It's taken by four of the Manly side. They pile him into the ground and that should be it. The Hoover sounds out across ANZ Stadium. So South Sydney will take a 14-6 lead to the break. I felt at half-time, I thought, ooh, we're still just not quite running out the door to go and get this done. South's about to come back. Cherry well, Evans starting the second half of the first preliminary final. One of these teams is 40 minutes away, firing Golden Point. Exactly lying in the back of the play of the ball, and here it is to Ballard. Ballard has scored. Once they scored one try, it became a snowball effect and then... Plus his brother has gone out to Cherry Evans, gone out to Jamie Lyon, he's all day. David Williams, did David Williams get it? Trying to, you know, claw the game back. And it's Reynolds, he kicks, it's a charge down, no knock on, and Simons is away! And away to a grand final, you would think. If I know it was full time, then it hurt, it hurt bad. So the final scoreboard, Sea Eagles 30, Rabbitohs 20. It was a tough change of room to be in. No one's talking, no one knows what to say. Everyone's heartbroken. Oh, that was my 19th birthday of that game, actually. You know, and when you're young at that age, you sort of take a lot of things for granted, and which, I, in my case, I probably did. You know, being a little bit older now, and understanding it's quite hard to get to a premium. We got to a lead, and we're trying to protect it rather than go on with the game. And as a younger player, I, I probably fell into that system a little bit myself. And as a senior player now, looking back at that, it was pretty disappointing. To be honest, I didn't have my best game in that game. In the second half, you know, they scored a couple of tries near my edge, so I was... Yeah, I was pretty disappointed with the way that year finished. Uh, we could have won that game, it would have took us to the GF and if we would have played the Roosters in the grand final, that would have been, you know, something massive. Michael Maguire I've already pointed out how disappointing this day has been. I think that's probably what hit us more was that we weren't able to play for Madge and, and his mum. She passed in the morning. She was very fond of the footy and she was hanging on to dear life. She was fighting pretty hard to try and stay there to get to the grand final, but it just wasn't to be. There was a fair bit of tears from everyone, um, even my family and all that sort of stuff they were down there. So I never forget, I had to go from that emotion into a press conference. I went, oof, this is going to be tough. It's been a tough day, of course, <laughs> but now we've got a great food team, uh, great people inside the footing organisation. You know, he's a strong man. And showing up for work when your mother passed away is, you know, pretty incredible effort. So. I needed to stay strong for the players. That was the thing that I was thinking about too, because I know the uh, my mum would kick me up the backside if I, I didn't stay strong in that space. I was the boys' leader, and I wanted to show that you know we we're not too far away. Yeah, we weren't told that. That was all kept real quiet. Once we did get hold of that, it was yeah, it was heart wrenching. He was determined not to let that be an excuse for the group. And the big thing we all wanted to do was try and get a result for him. And unfortunately, uh, that wasn't the case. The differences between the first year and the second year was his hope to everyone believed and we should have been there. 
And that's when I actually started to really realise, I think we can really do something here. The following year, we just, I don't think we haven't spoken about that. We just had that feeling of hurt to drive us. We had the World Cup at the end of 13. Me, George and Sam went to England for eight weeks and it, it was kind of refreshing, you know, we, with the disappointment of losing that prelim. I think they've been solid and the game management's been brilliant. St. puts it out just to St. Just go! Burgess just runs go. over Locke! Runs over Kevin Locke! We were over in England playing in the Rugby League World Cup and... It is New Zealand in the World Cup final! It's going to take a while to get over this one. Uh, there's a lot of work gone into this preparation. Uh, so I'm thoroughly disappointed at the moment. He kept going off and having a few meetings here and there. And Where are you going? Like, what have you been doing today? He's like, oh, I've just been meeting this person and that person. You know, a few people had gotten in his ear, so... We flew back together uh, after the World Cup back to Australia. And we went through Thailand and we had a couple of days in Thailand. Yeah, I kind of remember him saying, I've, I've got some offers to go play for England in, in the rugby union. So I, and I was just like, wow. The goal of playing for England Rugby Union was, was always a goal for him. There's been a lot of speculation in the media, you know, which I'd have preferred to keep out and, and like to be the first one to announce the news. But I just want to confirm myself that, um, you know, moving on at the end of this season, I'm going to play you know, Rugby Union in England. I'll finish the season here at South Sydney. I'll give it my everything I've got. You know, I look forward to doing my best for the club, you know, over the next sort of 12 months. I felt like when I left the Tigers, I was injured, I didn't really play that much. I wanted to leave on my terms. I feel so sorry for him. The fitness, he just didn't really have it. Once I'm back, I'm straight in. They went back to that, that bloody camp. Old movie. <laughs> Walking here trying to get these wounded soldiers back. I try and start it with a positive attitude, but it can go downhill very quick from there. So The one thing that we started to look at a little bit differently was just the mental side of the game. And everyone's going like, what is going on here? And we actually took Luke Keary, Dylan Walker and Adam Reynolds to Arizona. Uh, we've got uh, plenty of speed out wide. We brought over a couple of young superstars. I was so excited for obviously the Arizona stuff. We were kind of ready to kind of roll out. Doing all the pre-season, doing all the work and going into another year, knowing what happened previous two years, you know, you just want to start off on the right foot. I've got a couple of questions from the fans. Uh, if you could be a superhero, what would it be? Uh, I don't know, man. Start again. We start again. I don't know. I've got one, man. No, no, we don't need to start. You need to cut it up. And on with you, you're a um, big part of this community. You're, you're um, a leader for the youngsters, and you're going to uni. Talk to us about that. <laughs> Talk to us about uni, champ. What, what are you studying at uni? <laughs> bro, he quit, switch up, bro. He quit uni, bro. Yeah. He quit after two weeks. <laughs> 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 <laughs>